at doing community service for an organization called the Employee Awareness Association. This is a nonprofit organization based in San Diego that sends doctors from across the country out into our respective communities to do presentations on health-related topics. And I'm very, very happy to be here today to talk to you about stress. Anybody here have any stress in your life? I see a show of hands. What? Wait a second. I think I just saw every hand go up. <clears throat> Did you know that the number one cause for visits to doctor's offices in this country are stress-related problems? How many of you have heard that before? It's the truth. Stress is a major, major problem in our country. It's having huge impacts on a lot of different areas of health, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, how many of you'd like to learn some tips on how to manage your stress more effectively so it's not as big an impact on you? Good. Well, that's what we're here about. But before I get into that, would it be okay with you if I shared a little bit of my background so you guys know who I am and why I'm standing up here? First of all, um, I am not a first career chiropractor. I actually have an engineering degree from the University of Wisconsin in Madison and a master's degree in business administration from the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh. And when I get to that point in my intro, people look at me and go, what the heck are you doing standing here teaching a class as a chiropractor? I mean, you're kind of wondering that, right? <laughs> um, bottom line, I was blessed with something called sciatica. Have you heard of that before? Yeah, the sciatic nerves are the largest nerves in the body. They go down the back of the leg and into the foot. And I had debilitating sciatica. I couldn't sleep at night. I couldn't sit at my desk for any extended period of time. I had difficulty doing things like mowing the lawn, playing with my kids. I walked with a limp, and I tried everything to get rid of it. Tried the medical approach, tried physical therapy, eating, icing, stretching, nothing helped. And I was finally told there's nothing we can do for you. We don't know where it's causing the problem. And I went seven years that way. How many of you think that's a problem? Seven years going through life like that. By the way, don't get in a fight with poison ivy, okay? I just, if you're looking at my wrist, that's what that is, is poison ivy. So uh, anyway, um, one day I was at work limping, and one of my engineering colleagues said, why don't you go see a chiropractor? And I said, what's that? Because I'd never been to a chiropractor before. I didn't know anything about it. Basically convinced me to try it. And after seven years, the chiropractor was actually able to figure out what the heck was causing my problem and basically gave me back my life, got rid of that sciatica. And at that point, I started asking a lot of questions uh, about chiropractic, and the more that I learned, the more interested I became in doing this as a career and giving that same gift of help back to other people. So after 12 years as an engineer, wife and four kids in tow, packed up and moved to Davenport, Iowa, where I went to Palmer College of Chiropractic. Anybody heard of Palmer College before? There's, are you from Iowa by any chance? No, I have friends that go there. You have friends that go there, okay, very good. Uh, it was the first chiropractic school in the world. Uh, now, how many, just a question, how many credits does an average full-time student in college take per semester. Does anybody know? 16, 18. About 16, 17, 18. Going through chiropractic school, I was in a little hurry. I had a wife and four kids, five when I graduated. Um, 32 credits a semester. I was working two jobs to help pay the bills. How many of you think I had to learn a little something about stress management in order to get through that? Okay. What I'm gonna share with you are things that I have learned personally in my life that I use in my life to help me manage the stress. It seemed to work because I graduated first in my class and set up a wonderful practice in Southeast Wisconsin for six years, but I grew up here in the Twin Cities. I grew up in Burnsville. And it's hard to believe 15 years ago, we sold our office in Wisconsin, bought a practice in Woodbury, moved out to Oakdale a couple years after that, and I have now been blessed to have had the opportunity to touch literally thousands and thousands of lives, helping people regain their health and then maintain their health long term. I am a natural, uh, national speaker. I'm off the road for a year or two. I traveled extensively for four years, teaching on health-related topics all over the country, including to uh, other groups of doctors as well. And I am extremely happy to be here to spend a little bit of time with you here this afternoon. And my wish is that when we're done, and I'm going to ask you to do this, that you will find something in this presentation that you can change in your life that will improve your overall health. And if you can do that, then it's worth my time to be here today. So is that fair enough? Is that cool? Yeah. All right. So definition of stress, the rate of wear and tear on the body is a result of anxiety, worry, or exhaustion from a difficult or challenging situation. How about that one? Is that familiar to anybody? Anybody ever done that before? 
I, I've been here, my laptop dies about every other week, right? Mm -hmm. A hard, difficult, or intense experience, which if prolonged can cause irritation or damage to the nervous system. This is critically important because the nervous system is the major control system for the body. And if that system isn't working properly, we start to see problems show up from a health standpoint. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. So where do we have stress? Anybody have any work-related stress? Now, I know we're at work. It's okay to raise your hand anyway. It's all right. She right. would have turn around. Do you have job stress? Does anyone here have a relationship with another human being? Have you noticed sometimes those can be a little stressful, maybe? Yeah, kids, anybody got kids? We thought when they were raised and moved away that the stress would go away. You're a parent for the rest of your life. Did you know that? That's kind of weird. Junk food, okay? Chemical stresses. Did you know that your environment can actually add stress to your body? A lot of people don't know this, but too much light, too little light, too much noise, vibration, heat, all of that stuff can add to your stress. And a lot of times you're not even aware of it, but it's there, it's in the environment, okay? Medications, unfortunately, have things called side effects. You ever heard of those before? Okay, chemical stress on the body. And traumas, anybody here ever been in an auto accident? Yeah. Is that a lot of fun when you're in an auto accident? No. No. Does that put a little extra stress on you? A little bit. Yeah. And I see folks that come into my office, even a couple years post trauma, we're still having stress related issues secondary to those accidents. So there's a lot of areas where we can run into stress. And unfortunately, if you want to avoid stress, you need to avoid life. And I don't think anybody here wants yeah. to do that, right? <laughs> so how about if we figure out how to manage it? Does that sound like a good idea? Um, anybody heard of Dr. Hans Selye? Does that name ring a bell at all? Dr. Selye was a medical doctor who did research into stress and how our bodies react to stress. And he identified three different stages. First is something called the alarm stage or the fight or flight response. Have you heard of that before? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, fight or flight response, okay? Let's use a little example here. You're up north and you're walking through the woods and all of a sudden you see that sucker step out of the woods into the trail in front of you. What's your heart gonna do? Go up, somebody said stop. I think I heard stop. <laughs> stop is about right. Heart rate's gonna go up. What's your breathing gonna do? Go faster. What are your muscles gonna do? Get tight, why? What are you doing? You're getting ready to either run or if you're not that fast, you're going to be fighting a bear in a minute, right? <laughs> it's called the fight or flight response and it's a perfectly natural, normal response to stressors, to threats to us in the environment. It's the way we're wired and we're gearing up to be able to protect ourselves. Here's the problem. We have the exact same physiological response to being stuck in freeway traffic, money stress, relationship stress, job stress as we do if we're looking at a bear in the woods. How many of you knew that before? Physiologically, it's the same reaction in our body, right? Now, Dr. Sillier said um, one of two things happens. Either the threat goes away, meaning the bear goes back into the woods and after a little while our body goes back to its set point, or we adapt to the stress, okay? So let's say we're in the woods to get firewood, right? And we look at the bear and we make the assessment, the bear's not coming after me right now. I think I can get the firewood picked up. So you decide to go ahead and do that. And you pick up the firewood, but the whole time you're watching where that bear is to make sure that the bear is not coming after you, right? You accomplish the mission. How many degree? It's a little tougher to do when you got to keep an eye on the bear, right? So that's adaptation. We found a way to deal with the stressor of the bear and still get the job done. And we all do this every single day. But here's a problem. Let's say the bear's got some friends in the neighborhood. Now you've got six or seven bears running around in the woods that you have to keep track of while you're getting the firewood. And um, they like to party at night, so they're scratching on the outside of the cabin, right? And they find your cooler full of food, so they eat all your food. So you're hungry, you're not getting any sleep, and you gotta watch six or seven bears to go get firewood. How many of you think it's gonna start to get a little tiring doing that? Okay. And this is what happens. At a certain point, the stressors are too great for too long and we run into a problem where the body literally quits. It literally fails. We go into exhaustion. Have you heard stories of performers that collapse on stage during the performance, right? If you look at the history, they're typically been on the road for a long time. They're not sleeping. They're not eating properly. Frequently, they're chemically impaired, right? And their body's just 
crash. They're done. Okay? So those are the three stages of stress. Now, there's also a relationship between stress and productivity. Would you agree? We as human beings need to have some stress in our life in order to be happy and fulfilled. Would you agree with that? We need challenges. We need projects to work on. We need things to look forward to. And you can see here, if we have no stress in our life, we also have no productivity. Right? We don't do much. So let's add a little stress and look at what happens to the productivity. It takes off. Well, all of a sudden, we got projects to work on. We got things to look forward to. We're getting things accomplished. And the productivity goes up like a rocket. Have you ever been here? You got this project going on, you got that one going on, and this one's coming out beautiful, and you take on the next one, and you're energized, and you're having fun, and you're really fired up. Ever been there? It's called being in the zone. It's pretty cool. And it's right here. This is something called you stress. There is actually good stress out there. But let's say you're working on your projects, and somebody comes to you and says, hey, can you take on one more thing? And you go, eh, I don't know. Yeah, I'll do it. And you start working on the new project, and all of a sudden, this one over here that you've been working on starts to fall through the cracks. So you run over there to get that one, right? And as that falls through the cracks, this one starts falling through the cracks. And pretty soon, you're running around like a chicken with your head cut off. Have you ever heard, the faster I run, the behinder I get? This is what we're talking about. Look what happens to productivity. We add more stress. Not only does productivity not increase, but it decreases the more stuff we put on the plate. Okay? We run faster and harder and get less and less accomplished until we run right off the cliff. Question, if you want to be at peak levels of performance in all aspects of your life, whether it's here at work or with your family doing the things you want to do, where do you think you want to be on that curve? What's that? At the top, bingo, right there, you got it. That's where your peak performance is gonna be. So the key is to be able to figure out when you're going into the distress part of the curve and then take some action to get yourself back to the eustress side of the curve. Does that make sense? And that's what we're gonna be talking about here this afternoon is to help you get back to that top of the curve. Okay. So in exhaustion, our nervous system goes nuts and we see all kinds of hormones secreted into the body. When we're under stress, we lose the ability to digest food. If you're about to be digested by a bear, you need to worry about digesting the sub sandwich you just ate. Not that important, so it shuts down the essential parts of the body. We see a reduction in circulation to the heart. Where do you need the blood supply if you're gonna be fighting a bear? Extremities and the arms and the legs, right? You're either gonna run or fight. You gotta have the blood there. Is it important to fight the cold virus in your nose if you're going to be fighting a bear in a couple seconds? Not that important, right? And we see a reduction in oxygenation in the cells of the body as well. And we have stress hormones, cortisol, adrenaline, norepinephrine. Uh, you've all heard about these before. These are secreted when our stress levels go up and they have different impacts in the body as well. Would you agree with me that if you give food to college students, you can get them to do anything you want? Would you agree with that? Yes. Yeah. Carnegie Mellon University did a study where they managed to find 400 people who were willing to let them squirt the cold virus up their nose. Anybody here want to do that? <laughs> Give them a pizza. They're happy. Give them to squirt the stuff up their nose. I don't know. But anyway, um, they found that those who had high levels of stress in their lives were twice as likely to develop a cold as those who did not have that much stress. Have you noticed that people in your life who are stressed all the time tend to get sick a lot? Yeah. Okay. That's why, because it suppresses the immune system. It's hard to fight the infections, right? University of Michigan found that poorly managed anger is linked to two and a half times greater risk of heart, or deaths from heart disease. So now I'm gonna go through a list of items here. I don't want you to raise your hand and go, ooh, ooh, that's me, that's me. Um, I just want you to make a mental note in your mind of which ones of these items apply. And if this applies to you, just keep track, okay? And then we'll talk about what this means. So some of the symptoms of stress, headaches. Okay. We know that people under stress have a tendency to have headaches and have more frequent headaches than people who have lower levels of stress. Fatigue. Do you feel fatigued at the end of the day? Do you feel like sometimes you haven't accomplished anything at the end of the day, even though you've been working hard all day? Do you have pain, tension in the neck, shoulders, or low back? Where do people store their stress? She just went like this, right here, and she's going, oh, I can feel it, right? I get them in my office all the time. They come in and they look like this. And they're not stressed at all. Life is really good, right? 
we store it here, we store it in the neck, we store it in the low back, we store it in the legs. A lot of times people will store their stress there as well, right? Irritability, do you get a little cranky <laughs> when you're under stress? I know I do, I get a little cranky. Sleep problems, did you know when we're stressed out we can't sleep? And that's a problem, because that's like a downward spiral. And the more we learn about how important sleep is, the more we're learning how detrimental this really is in terms of our overall health. Sinus and allergy problems. A lot of people, it cracks me up, they come in and go, my allergies are killing me today. And, uh, and we'll look at the pollen counts. It's not a problem. When your stress levels go up, believe it or not, you have more symptoms, sinus and allergy type symptoms. The sinuses flare up. A lot of people don't realize that. It may not be allergies. It may be you're allergic to your stress. Digestive problems, okay? Things like irritable bowel syndrome, chronic constipation, chronic diarrhea. We see this heartburn showing up um, because of the impact that stress has. So, take a look at the list, take a look at you. The bottom line is that the items on this list indicate that your body is beginning to break down as a result of stress. The more of the items that you just picked out on that list that apply to you right now, the more likely it is that stress is having a negative impact on you from an overall health standpoint, okay? How many of you would like to learn how to handle that? Hey. Yeah, all right, good. And by the way, how many of you just kind of went, ah, really? Because that happens a lot when I do this talk. People really don't realize how much stress they have. So what can you do? Now, I'm gonna push the button here in a minute, and then I'm gonna ask you, please, don't moan when I do this, okay? Oh, geez, he did it. He went and did it. He put that nasty word up there, didn't he? How many of you exercise on a regular basis? You're ahead of the curve. Anybody take a guess? What's the average in the United States in terms of percentage of people that work out on a regular basis? 17 percent. Who said 20? Somebody said 20. 20 is right up. You guys, you're good. That's pretty good. About 20 percent. Okay. I do a lot of talks for the wise around the Twin Cities, and they're about 98 percent. I would hope so. Um, but you guys are about 40 to 50 percent. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. Exercise, really, really important. Would it make sense to you if your body is gearing up to either run or fight? If you do something that's similar to running or fighting, you're going to burn off those stress hormones and get back to your set point again. And that's exactly what happens. That's what exercise does for us. It helps us to burn off that stress. So um, they followed 40,000 postmenopausal women for seven years. They found that those who engage in moderate activity, which is walking at a moderate pace for about 20 minutes a day, 41% lower death rate than those who had no exercise. Cal State, and I even knew this back when I was an engineer, when it felt like the whole world was caving in on my head. I'd go take my leg for a drag around the plant for about 10 or 15 minutes. And when I came back in, 10 minute walk increases your energy, alters your mood, and affects a positive outlook for up to two hours after just a 10 minute walk. It doesn't have to be a lot. University of Minnesota right here, 12,000 men, they found that those who walk and did similar exercise for an average of 20 minutes a day, 37% less likely to die of coronary disease than those who exercise less than that. How many of you think exercise might have a positive impact on your health? Mm -hmm. Not possible, right? So here's some exercise guidelines. First of all, please don't just jump in. Um, if you haven't been doing any exercises for a long time, go get checked because there can be underlying health issues that you don't know about that are there that are gonna impact your ability to work out. I see this as a chiropractor. Folks go in and start working out for the first time in 15 or 20 years, and they've got underlying degenerative changes, arthritis, things like that, that they didn't know they had. And when they start exercising, then it gets aggravated, then they can't exercise because it's a problem, and then they get frustrated. So get checked, make sure that it's okay to get started. Decide what you're gonna do. Would you agree with me? <laughs> if you hate running, the last thing on earth you're going to do is run for exercise. Would you agree? Okay. So pick something you like. I have a patient right now. He's in his early 60s. The guy looks like he's in his late 40s. He plays hardcore tennis, full speed, two hours at a crack, two to three times a week. Okay. Loves to play tennis. That just absolutely fires him up. Another guy, similar situation, plays volleyball three nights a week. The guy loves playing volleyball. It's fantastic. Pick something you like. You'll stick with it and make it a habit and it'll have a positive impact on you. Here's another one. <laughs> Anybody in here still 19? <laughs> maybe, maybe one, right? I, I love this. You know, got the 48-year-old guy who hasn't gotten off the couch for 30 years. 
And then he decides he's going to go bench press Volkswagens like he did when he was 19. And then he gets hurt because it doesn't work that way anymore, right? So start out slow, work your way up, be careful, make sure that you're, that you're taking this uh, carefully. Aerobic exercise, the kind of exercise that increases your heart rate and keeps it up for about 20 to 30 minutes is the best kind of exercise for burning off stress. So things like walking, running, swimming, riding a bike, stair stepper, that kind of thing, where you're using the big muscle groups to get that heart rate up, really, really important as part of a workout routine. But don't forget, please, the warm up and the cool down. I see this in my office a lot too. I was gonna do my workout, but I was running late and I didn't have time, so I didn't warm up because I just wanted to get to the workout and then they've got pulled muscles and they've got tendonitis problems showing up and ligament issues and things like that. So. Um, make sure that you warm up and cool down in terms of your workout. And using strength training is really important. Um, you know what strength training is, right? Working against resistance, exercise bands, lifting weights, things like that. Helps to build lean muscle mass. Lean muscle burns a lot of calories. It helps you control your weight a whole lot better. For ladies in here, it is really important to help build bone density so you don't have bone density issues later on after menopause. Uh, and uh, overall, it's great for just maintaining your functional capability. Uh, so you want to take care of the strength training as well. So how many of you right now are thinking maybe exercise might be something you need to do? Add it to your routine. All right, fantastic. Good, 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 good. That's pretty sweet. Next, eat healthy. You're going, huh? Yeah, great idea. What does that mean? How many of you get confused? Yeah, me too. Changes every five minutes, doesn't it? First of all, let me ask you a question. Would you agree that we eat too many carbs as a society? Would yeah. you agree with that? Yeah. No. No? You'd like to have more, wouldn't you? Yeah, this, this next part of the talk, you're gonna to wanna to go like this, okay? <laughs> um, let's have some fun. Is it okay if we have a little fun for a minute? What does the average person eat for breakfast? Cereal. Cereal, Cereal. carbohydrate. What else? Toast. Bagel. Toast, bagel. carbohydrate, bagel, yeah. carbohydrate. What else? Donut, carbohydrate, salt, and fat. Oatmeal. Oatmeal, carbohydrate. Orange juice, carbohydrate. I heard a yogurt, maybe a little protein in the yogurt, right? That's how we start our day, folks. Most people, most people started off, if they eat breakfast at all, big load of carbs, right? So, lunch, let's go to lunch. What do you have for lunch? Sandwich. A sandwich, think about a sandwich a minute. You have two big pieces of carbohydrate, with a little bit of protein stuck in the middle, right? And then you gotta have something to go with the sandwich. What do you have? Chips. Yes! Yeah. Carbohydrates <laughs> soaked in fat! It's great! Yeah! Yay! And then, okay, so maybe you're healthy, so you have a piece of fruit, right? Which is a carbohydrate. There's different kinds, we'll talk about that in a minute. But let's say the peanut butter gets stuck right here. What do you use to wash it down? Milk! Milk. What do most people use? Soda. What kind? Oh, you got the diet stuff. <laughs> Did you know, I'm not making this up, true story, the number one fluid consumed on the face of planet Earth is not water? Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola. I'm not kidding. Sugar bomb in a can, right? Tons of sugar. I, I was watching a show about six months ago. They were in Azerbaijan in some village. They're literally, they've got a donkey pulling a wheeled cart through town. And in the window of a shop is a Coca-Cola sign. And I'm going, you've got to be kidding me. But that's what we eat, right? So now let's let you go out to dinner. Sit down. What's the first thing they ask you at your favorite restaurant? Would you like a cocktail? Alcohol, carbohydrate, right? Then they bring you a big basket of what? Bread. Yeah, yeah bread. Yeah. Good stuff. Then the salad, carbohydrate soaked with fat. And then the main course. You ever looked at the main course? You got a baked potato the size of Nebraska. You got a pile of broccoli the size of California. You got a teeny weeny bit of meat or, meat or fish, right? A little bit of protein. Carb, carb, protein. And you're still hungry. So what do you have? Dessert. I have never seen a high protein dessert ever, okay? They're packed with sugar. Now here's the problem. By the way, is this real? Okay, this is real. This is the way we eat. Here's the problem that we have. When you eat simple carbohydrates, like simple sugars, the minute that hits your tongue, your blood sugar goes up like a rocket, okay? Pancreas goes nuts, dumps all kinds of insulin into your bloodstream, 
The insulin tells the cells take sugar out of the bloodstream. So they go crazy and suck the sugar out and your blood sugar goes like this. Have you ever had the two o'clock in the afternoon sitting at your desk, eyes rolling back in your head, can't stay awake, can't focus, you know what I'm talking about, right? Probably had a lot of pasta for lunch. What do people do when they feel like that? <laughs> Snickers bar in a Mountain Dew. Boom, up goes the blood sugar again, right? And we're doing this all day long. Here's the problem though. The blood sugar swings are extremely hard on the body. Number one, it can cause type two diabetes. Have you guys heard we have an epidemic of type two diabetes in this country? We do. Uh, and this is where it's coming from. It causes obesity. Simple sugars convert to stored fat very, very quickly. And we get that stored fat and we're going through this roller coaster type thing. And the third thing is these blood sugar swings are extremely hard on the nervous system. The nerves can't handle it. Have you heard of diabetic neuropathy? Mm -hmm. And folks who've got diabetes with real blood sugar issues, the nerves literally will start to die because of this. And that's a problem. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Okay? So how do you get off the blood sugar roller coaster? 40% of the calories that you eat in a given day should be in the form of complex carbohydrates. You're nodding. You've heard this before. Mm -hmm. Where did you hear this? School. School. Cool. Awesome. That's fantastic. 40% complex carbs. Now this is whole fruits, whole vegetables, very limited grains, whole grains, very limited. We now know that from research, even small amounts of grain still are very high on this glycemic index and can really cause blood sugar swings. So small amounts of whole grain. Uh, it's closer to the source you can get it, the better. The more processing that's done, the longer from the time it's harvested, the more nutrients you lose and the more likely it is that junk gets added in there, sugars and things like that, okay? So 40%, 30% lean protein. For a lot of folks, this is a significant increase in the amount of protein that you're gonna eat during the day. Things like lean uh, chicken, fish, vegetable proteins, things like that. Why? Complex carbohydrates, number one, have a lot of vitamins and minerals and fiber and things that we need to be healthy. And they release blood sugar way more slowly into the bloodstream than the simple sugars do. So we have a leveling effect on the blood sugar. When you mix protein in, protein converts to blood sugar, but it takes a ton of effort on the body's part to do that. It takes a long time to switch it over to sugar. So again, we have a very long, slow release of sugar into the bloodstream. The combination, we see the blood sugar level stay level, and we're not on this roller coaster. My challenge to you, if you're eating a lot of carbs right now, make this switch. You will be amazed. Do this for a month and you tell me if your energy levels don't stay elevated throughout the course of the day and you're able to do way more things than you could do before and still have plenty of energy to spare. How many of you'd like to have a little more energy to spare? Okay. My challenge, try it. So 40% complex carbs, 30% lean protein, and then a little bit of unsaturated fat, 30%, um, olive oil, canola oil, things like that. And guess what? The research is now saying you can even eat about 10% of this in the form of saturated fat. What'd they tell you five years ago about eating butter? Don't eat butter, it's gonna kill you, right? What were you supposed to eat? Margarine, yeah, that was healthy for you, right? New research, this is, I promise you've never heard this before. Maybe, maybe some of you have. They went back and looked at the studies where they determined the connection between saturated fat and heart disease. And they found that in those studies, they never separated the trans fats from the naturally occurring saturated fat. When they go back and look at the data and now with new research coming out, they're finding there's no link between naturally occurring saturated fats, things that have been part of our diet for centuries and centuries, and heart disease. There is a massive link between trans fats and heart disease. Anybody know what trans fats are like chemically? You're not, what, what do you think they're like? Trans fats, they have more room, right? Because saturated, yeah, like the chemicals. Yeah. I can't remember how to explain it. The, well, yeah. they have more room and chemically they're very similar to plastic. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're basically eating plastic. No wonder it clogs the arteries, right? Go ahead and eat the butter. Just don't eat a pound and a half at a time, right? Okay. Eat a little bit, it's okay. I used to have to say, cocoa butter is bad for you. Okay, saturated fat, you can't eat it. Go ahead and have a little chocolate, it's okay. <laughs> Just don't eat five pounds at one time, okay? <laughs> So that's the latest research. Go cool on that, 40, 30, 30. Any questions on how to do that? Yes? 
if we want to avoid trans fats, what do we need to avoid? All the processed stuffs, the margarines definitely, fried foods are generally gonna have a lot of trans fats in them. A lot of the salad dressings, things like that still have trans fats. You gotta look at the label and see what's in there and then stay away from those. Ideally, you go 100% natural, you don't have to worry about it in the first place, okay? So like grass-fed red meat is okay. It's okay to eat that, it's pretty good. How many just learned something, by the way? That's cool, that's worth coming to do that. Uh, so there you have it. Processed foods, sugar, saturated fats, and fried foods are gonna be the ones that you wanna stay away from from a dietary standpoint. You may wanna think about taking a B-complex supplement if your stress levels are really through the roof. We burn a ton of B vitamins when we're under stress. And a lot of people who really are stressed can benefit from taking a supplement. How many take supplements right now out of curiosity? Oh, cool, a lot of folks. Um, would you like to know a cute little trick to find out if your supplement's actually breaking down and absorbing into your body? So you're not just paying money for nothing? Try this, take your supplement. About an hour to an hour and a half after you take the supplement, the color of your urine should turn a very bright fluorescent yellow color. And if you see that reaction, that's the B vitamins that have been, that have been taken in from the supplement that are passing out through the kidneys. That means you're absorbing them and you're getting enough. If you don't see the change, you're either not taking enough or you got a supplement that doesn't break down and you're wasting your money, you gotta go find a different supplement, okay? So there's a little tip for you. A little side note, kinda cool. So B vitamin, you may wanna think about that. <coughs> Laughter, would you agree that if you're looking at your life circumstances and you can laugh at them, you're 98% of the way home to being able to deal with it. Would you agree with that? Would you also agree that we as human beings tend to make mountains out of little tiny things? Yeah, so laughter is kind of an important thing. We know that laughter uh, reduces those stress hormones that we were talking about before. We've done a lot of research on the laughter. We found it to be uh, really, really helpful for reducing the stress hormones. Laughter also increases endorphins. What are those, does anybody know? The feel good hormones, you got it. Makes you feel great when, at same, we get the same thing from exercise, by the way, we release endorphins into the brain. Our immune system kicks up, antibody producing cells and T cell effectiveness both go up when we laugh. If you don't wanna get sick, laugh a lot. Kind of a cool, interesting perspective there. Laughter gives you a good workout. Have you ever laughed so hard that your stomach was sore for about three days? <laughs> I have, it's like, wow, that was pretty good, right? You get a distraction from anger, guilt, and the negative emotions that we deal with, and here's the biggie. We get a chance to step back away from the mountain and look at the molehill. And we go, okay, maybe is isn't that bad after all. Maybe we can handle this, okay? Now, have you ever watched a TV show with one of those stupid laugh tracks on it that every five seconds is laughing and just annoys the daylights out of you? Have you ever watched that before? You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, um, those aren't helpful. Okay, don't watch those. It's just not funny and it's annoying and your stress levels will go up. Don't do that. Watch stuff that's truly funny, that really gets you laughing. And if you're having a hard time finding stuff, there's a whole bunch of old recordings. If you ever watch Bob Hope and Red Skelton, I know I'm dating myself a little bit, but those guys were hilarious. Carol Burnett, some of the stuff that they did back in the day, and it is really, really, really funny. So if you can't find something current, uh, go back and, and get some older stuff. It's pretty good. Uh, also, we know that you will laugh longer and you'll laugh harder if you're with friends. So go to the movie with friends, go to the comedy club with friends, have friends over to watch the funny TV show that you like to watch, and you'll get a bigger bang for the buck in terms of the amount of laughter that you get. Um, laughing sessions. Thank you, dude. How many of you heard of laughing sessions? Anybody? Where'd you hear about laughing sessions? Just people laughing from the 1930s. Wow, that's pretty cool. These things um, have been used literally clinically to help people with anxiety disorders, with depression disorders. What they do is they get a group of people together and they just sit in a circle and one person starts laughing. And the next one starts laughing. And the next one starts laughing. And they just laugh, and they keep on laughing, and they just laugh for no reason whatsoever. And I'm looking around, and even as I'm talking about it, all these faces, <laughs> everybody's got a smile, and there's people laughing in here, right? It, it's awesome. You can do this yourself. I have a, a wonderful mentor of mine. The guy is in his 90s now. 
Um, but when he was a younger man, he found himself in utter despair, completely broke, bankrupt, living in a trailer behind a friend's house with his entire family. That's all they had in the entire world. Devastating. They had laughing sessions every night, and they got through it. And he ended up becoming a multimillionaire, very successful. His kids have grown up, become very successful, and they got through it. But in the darkest hours, when other people would be filled with despair, they got together every night and laughed about it. And they got through it. Yeah. Laughing sessions are pretty cool. And if you got nothing else to laugh at, bottom line, go look in the mirror. <laughs> Y'all are funny looking. I just want to let you know. <laughs> How long can the average person live without food? Does anybody know? 21 days. Wow. Nailed that. Three to four weeks. Did you say that? Who said that? Who said 21 days? You did that? Awesome. That's pretty good. How long can you live without water? Seven Five days. Five days. Seven days. I'm hearing numbers. Three to four days, roughly. How long can you live without a nervous system? <laughs> Not long. Anybody heard of the guillotine? Did they put people's feet in there? What they put in there? The head. Yeah, there's something that has to do with that nervous system. Would you agree most people have a brain? I'm looking right now in the back row and I'm seeing some people going, hey, I don't know. All right, let me ask it differently. Would you agree if they're operating breathing, they at least have some brain function? Would you agree with that? Okay, very good. We're on the same picture. What's the brain do? What's its job? Controls the body, controls everything else. Heart rate, breathing, body temperature, movement of muscles, digestion of food. Your immune response, all that stuff is controlled by the brain. How does the brain connect to the body? What connects them? Spinal cord and the nerves, you got it. Brain sends information down through the spinal cord, out through the nerves that go in between the bones of the spine, and those things go everywhere throughout the body and tell the body what to do. Body does it, sends information back up to the brain saying we got it done, and the communication is always going back and forth. Would you agree that's pretty cool? It works awesome. It works really, really, really well. It's an awesome system. However, we know from research that they did at the University of Colorado that it takes pressure as light, imagine this now, as a feather landing on the back of your hand to reduce the flow of information through a nerve root by up to 50%. Yeah, most people haven't heard that study. It's amazing. Very little pressure, dramatic impact. So let me ask you this. Now you've got a situation where the brain is trying to send information out to the body to tell it what to do, and it can't get through because there's basically a tree landing on the phone line here, can't communicate. Would you agree with me that eventually that part of the body that can't talk to the control center is gonna stop working properly? Would that make sense to everybody? And that's what we see, okay? We see a departure from health, eventually the organ systems don't work the way they're supposed to and we start to see health problems showing up. Here's the problem with this. When we're under stress, this is aggravated. The nerves are being attacked because of the stress and the blood sugar swings and everything else that we've got going on. By the way, those sugar swings are worse when we're under stress. And we already have a compromised nervous system. Now you put pressure on the nerve on top of it and this is where we start to see major departures from health. And this is where I, as a chiropractor, come into play because we're trained to find areas in the spine where the bones are out of position in a way that they're putting pressure on the nerves and put the bone back where it belongs. It takes the pressure off the nerve, restores the connection between the brain and the body, and as a result, we see a restoration of normal function. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. So keeping that nervous system functioning is really, really important, particularly when you're under stress, because the nervous system is already getting hammered by the changes, chemical changes in your body. Also, trigger point therapy. How many of you have ever had a massage before? Deep tissue massage. Not a Swedish cruise ship, hot stone, rubby dubby massage, but a real deep tissue massage. Where do we store our stress again? Right here, yeah, the neck and shoulders and stuff. We form trigger points in our muscles when they stay tight for too long. Deep tissue massage will release those trigger points and flush something called lactic acid out of the muscles and get them to relax. So, regular massages, great idea to help you get rid of that stored stress that you're carrying around in the neck and the back. And finally, this is a killer. Would you agree in the Twin Cities, people are really, really high energy, go, 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 go? Would you agree with that? 
I've traveled all over the country. I've been to many, many cities, and I will tell you, this place has energy, man. It's crazy. It's hard to get people to take rests once in a while in this environment, and unfortunately, it can be to the detriment of our health. So, um, hobbies. How many of you have hobbies out of curiosity? Ooh, cool. Well, this might be one that a few folks want to add to their list. If you have a lot of physical activity, you're up moving around all day long, lifting, bending, twisting, whatever, doing something that's a lower activity level, like reading, knitting, or playing the piano, will allow you to get some balance back in your body, okay, and, and in your day-to-day -day activities. If you're sedentary, doing something active, gardening, woodworking, hiking, things like that, uh, biking can be really, really good. You kill the exercise and you kill the hobby at the same time, which is kind of nice, okay? So again, getting some balance back in your life that way. Sleep. How much sleep does the average person in the United States guess? What, get? what do you guys think? Six. Six. You're optimistic. Wow, wow, wow. <laughs> Somewhere around five. Wow. Five to six is what people get across the country. And I know that, that research is saying that, but I also know that from doing surveys across the country. How much do we need? Eight to nine. Eight to nine. Eight to nine hours of sleep critically important. Number one, during the day, when you guys are doing your daily activities, did you know that you're incurring what's called microtraumas to your bodies? Your ligaments, your muscles, your joint surfaces, all this stuff gets beat up during the course of the day because of the effects of gravity and the activities that we do. And when we sleep at night, that's when we repair that damage. If you don't get enough sleep, you don't get the damage repaired. And then we see things like arthritis and degenerative disc disease and ligament problems and we see tendonitis develop because it's not healing. Second, did you know that when you're awake and experiencing your day-to-day -day activities, you have all this information that you store temporarily. At night, you take all that information and you put it into nice little neat files and you stick them in the filing cabinets so that you can remember this stuff for later use. You don't learn from the experience during the day, you learn by taking that experience and organizing it and storing it when you're sleeping. Okay. Anybody ever pull all-nighters out of curiosity? Yeah, when you're in college? How did it work? <laughs> I'm seeing people go like this. I, I, I've discovered in chiropractic school taking 32 credits, I went to bed at 10 o'clock, folks. I didn't do all-nighters because I couldn't remember anything. I, I couldn't retain it. I had to get some sleep. So that's important. And finally, this is a whole other subject, and if you ever want to have me come back, I'll be happy to do this. Um, we are also now learning that how you think and how you perceive your environment directly impacts the expression of the DNA in your cells. And when we sleep at night is when we recharge this big battery in the sky to help operate that. Have you ever had a night where you didn't sleep very well the night before? What do you feel like the next day? Cranky, what does your body feel like? Tired, doesn't want to do anything physically, you feel weak, right? That's a direct impact from your brain to the individual cells in your body. And it's a fascinating connection. We're learning something called epigenetics, brand new area of research. And I would be happy to come back and talk about that sometime if you're interested, okay? Uh, so get some sleep, make sure that you're getting enough sleep. If you can't sleep, first of all, please stop working two hours before. Anybody get emails? Yeah, you're going, oh no. <laughs> you're working right up till bedtime, aren't you? Or sending emails to friends? Yeah, uh -huh, you got it. Um, I see that a lot. I get emails from folks at 10.30 at night. Why are you sending emails at 10.30 at night? You're supposed to be sleeping. Um, did you know, by the way, that the blue light that comes from your computer screen can mess up your sleep patterns? Did you know that? Did you also know that there's an app you can download now that will change the color in the evening so that you don't have that blue light in there and mess up your sleep? Something to think about. You might want to just, that might be the one thing you want to do that improves your overall health here. Light reading, if you're uh, unable to sleep, do that before you go to bed. Here's a biggie. Have you ever had that night where you're laying down and for the life of you, you can't get your brain to shut up, right? And you're trying to sleep and your brain keeps going around and around and around and you can't get rid of that? How many of you had that? Out of curiosity. Okay, I'm seeing people smiling at me, hands going up. Would you like a tip on how to deal with that? Get up. Get a piece of paper. Get a pencil and write all the stuff down that you're trying to store in your brain. And there is something that happens in taking it from your thinking brain and putting it on the piece of paper. And when you set that piece of paper aside, your subconscious goes, okay, it's there. It's gonna be there in the morning. 
it's okay to shut down the system and your, your subconscious mind is what shuts you down for sleep and it'll let you fall asleep. Anybody ever done this out of curiosity? Yeah, work for you? Work for you? There you go, fantastic. I have done this with patients, I personally have done it and it works amazingly. So maybe that's a little something like that. And then avoid caffeine and alcohol before bed, that's pretty much everybody knows that one. So. And then finally, question. Would you agree that we celebrate being sick in this country? Would you agree with that? I see some people nodding. Some people are getting it. What do you do when you're sick? Do you come to work? No, you don't come to work when you're sick. You stay home. And what do you do when you're home? You relax, you put your blankie on, right? And you have your cocoa, and you can watch your favorite shows and read your magazines that you have been able to read, right? And it's, it's awesome, except you're sick. I got an idea. Why not do those things when you're starting to see yourself go into the distress side of the curve and get yourself back to the eustress side of the curve and not get sick in the first place? Think about that. So something that I've taught for many, many years. I always get in trouble with the HR people until they actually go, hey, this makes sense. Why not, if you find that you're going into the distress side of the curve and you recognize it, take a wellness day, take a break, and go do the stuff that you would do to recharge your batteries. Or if you were sick, go do that. If you want to read your magazines and watch TV, do it, okay? And then come back on the good stress side of that curve. You'll be amazed. You're gonna get more done in less time. You're gonna stay healthier. You're gonna be more productive. You're gonna have way more levels of energy if you give yourself permission to do that. How many think that sounds like a pretty cool idea? That doesn't mean that every day is a wellness day, okay? You can't call in sick every single day, but when you get to the point, I have patients active in my practice now who got this idea and they use it periodically in their life in order to help get that balance back and they have seen amazing changes in productivity as a result. So, is that pretty cool? Cool. Any questions about that? All right. So, here we go. What have we got? How do you manage your stress? Exercise burns off the stress hormones. It's a great way to get your body back into balance. Eating healthy, 40, 30, 30, 40% 40 complex carbs, 30% lean protein, 30% unsaturated fat with a little bit of saturated in there. Laughter is the best medicine. Get the pressure off your nervous system so it can work properly and give yourselves a chance to take a break once in a while. You guys think you can do that? Ah, cool. Did you learn something? Yeah. Yes. All right. Very good. Now, a couple things before we wrap this up. First of all, um, I do want to encourage you, please. How many of you learned something here today that you can do, that you can change in your life that will improve your overall health? How many of you got something out of this? How many, can I see hands? Let's make sure I, okay, cool. How many of you promised me you'll do it? All right. If you'll do it, then it's worth my time to come here and do this today. I also, um, as you know, do this as a community service. And before coming here today, I made a decision to donate some of my time for folks in this group who need that time to be donated, okay? Basically what I've done is I have set aside five appointment times, maybe if you talk to me nice, maybe I'll do a little more, but um, to come in and meet with me in my office. If you're having significant health issues, if you're having stress-related problems, or if you're having other types of health problems, that maybe you'd like to discuss and see if there's something that can be done about it. Um, these are screening evaluations. There's no charge for this. I'm donating this time. This is a gift to you from me. Basically, we do a complete case history with you. We find out what you're dealing with personally, how you got to where you are, and then we would do some screening tests to see if I can figure out what's actually causing your problem. If I think you've got a problem I can help you with, I'll let you know and I'll explain it to you. If I think you've got a problem that needs to be seen by another healthcare provider, I will be happy to make a referral for you. My purpose here is to help you get this taken care of so that you can be as healthy as you can possibly be. Um, now, there's no charge for this, I'm happy to do it, but there is a catch. Everybody goes, there's, a, there's always a catch, right? So here it is. I'm super busy in my practice. I have a packed office, and I'm gonna take about a half hour to 45 minutes to meet with you, I'm happy to do it. 
but I would ask you, please don't schedule one of these appointments with me unless you're really serious about coming in, keeping the appointment, and, and getting your problem evaluated. Reason is, if you schedule it and then you don't keep the appointment, there's other people who need to get in who can't, and that's just not fair to them. So I would ask you, be respectful of that. Otherwise, I will be thrilled to death to take the time that I need to take to see if we can get to the bottom of what you're dealing with. So if you'd like to accept that gift when we're done here, um, come on up. I have a few appointment times that I've brought with me. We'll see if we can find a day and a time that will work for you. We'll bring you in and we'll see if we can get, get to the bottom. Okay? Is that fair enough? Is it okay if I do that for you guys? Yeah. Right.